Welcome everyone, if you're just joining, we're waiting for one more speaker and we will go ahead and get started here shortly. All right, we are um, a couple minutes past the half hour mark here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We're waiting for one more person to join us, but I believe that they are on their way and we'll probably just hop right in. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today for this workshop. Uh, before we got, dive into the details presented by our expert panelists, I wanted to give uh, each of you some background information on the team here at Sierra Business Council and why we're hosting this workshop today. My name is Jill Sanford, and alongside my colleagues, Justine Queeley and James Sedlak, I will be moderating this workshop today. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and drop questions either there or in the Q&A feature, whichever works best for you. A little about Sierra Business Council. We're a nonprofit based in Truckee that serves the entire Sierra region. Our programs are focused on regional advocacy, economic empowerment, and climate action. And one of our programs that serves several of these focus areas in the region is Sierra Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Partnership, or Sierra Camp for short. Sierra Camp is a cross-sector partnership that promotes and facilitates regional climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. And it's actually a membership-based program, and our members include organizations, businesses, and local governments. Once a quarter, we host a public workshop on topics chosen by our members. Uh, to learn more about becoming a, a member, please email sierracamp at sierrabusiness.org. We'll go ahead and drop that contact in the chat. Um, and then to give you a, a brief overview of our um, agenda today, I'm going to pass it off to Justine Quigley. Hi, everyone. Great to be here today for this workshop. Um, we will have three brief presentations from our speakers, and then we'll follow up um, with about 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, we also wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of California transportation legislation to kind of set the stage for our workshop today. Um, we're focused on EV infrastructure and fleet electrification as our topic, and we are diving deeper into that. So if you came to hear about EVs, you're in the right place. Um, I also wanna say thank you so much to our panel of expert speakers. Um, who are dedicating their time today to share their programs and resources with you. We hope you find it as valuable as we do. So I'm honored to introduce um, Tara Campy from CalStart. She is the HVIP Deputy, Deputy Director. Um, Omar Ferris and Michael Kadish from SoCal Edison, who are both transportation electrification advisors. And Tim O'Neill from PG&E, who is an electric vehicle onboarding expert. Um, we will let each speaker introduce themselves and show their own slides and provide an overview of their respective programs in just a moment. So to kind of um, set the stage for today, I wanted to um, share with you some high level information about the legislative arm of California and how that relates directly to transportation and therefore electric vehicles. So since 2005, the state of California has responded to growing concerns over the effects of climate change by adopting a comprehensive approach to addressing emissions in the public and private sectors through legislative action. And some of those um, impact the public sector directly when it comes to transportation and electric vehicle infrastructure and fleet electric electrification. And the primary responsibility for coordinating the implementation of those different kinds of programs and legislations and mandates and policies um, is the California Air Resources Board, better known as CARB. So if you have any more specific questions today, they are probably the best when it comes to that nitty gritty policy um, information. But to kind of set the stage, the first biggest piece um, that California started with back in 2006 is AB 32, um, better known as the 
Global Warming um, Solutions Act from 2006. Um, and out of that came the Climate Change Scoping Plan, which is a plan that is the primary mechanism for describing any kind of strategies, targets, standards, um, et cetera, that California um, needs to undertake to achieve the goals set out by AB 32. Um, and the scoping pl plan includes um, sectors for clean energy, clean transportation, energy efficiency, land use, agriculture, as well as other sectors. Um, it's updated every four years, and it's important to note that the most recent update from um, this process is happening this year in 2021 um, will be the first to incorporate the goal um, of establishing a statewide achievement of net carbon neutrality by 2045. And that's really important for the transportation sector, especially because it's one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions um, in the state. Um, there is more information on that and more details um, inside with the scoping plan um, if you want to learn more about that. The second one is the Innovative Clean Transit um, Regulation. This basically um, is a 100% goal for new purchase of by transit agencies um, to be zero emission buses. Um, so that's by um, a full transition by 2040 um, and to begin now if possible. Um, so to achieve the overall goals set out, especially in AB 32, when we're looking at California's greenhouse gas um, reduction goals, it's really important to kind of um, start to set different um, parameters that um, different agencies can follow. And so to have something very specific like this is important for any kind of agency um, who needs to have a plan to implement and um, participate in achieving those larger state goals. Um, in the transportation sector. So implementing these zero emission technologies is necessary to effectively address um, all of those different kinds of air quality and climate protection issues. So this, re this uh, particular regulation is critical um, for transitioning California's heavy duty fleet um, to zero emission and to help achieve those goals. It also is aligned with other state policies such as SB 375 and SB 350 um, which all um, move us closer toward transit-oriented communities, better connected transportation, um, and active transportation. And more information can be found about that at, on the CARB website as well. And then last, um, I wanted to highlight the new executive order um, for um, that's N7920, um, which is the Zero Emission by 2035 executive order. And this calls for the elimination of new internal combustion passenger vehicles by 2035. And furthermore, this um, provides time for automakers to scale up and market new zero emission vehicles, which supports that overall goal of reducing and reaching carbon um, neutrality, but also um, supports infrastructure, electric utilities, and others to plan and support for increasing consumer demand for these vehicles as well as um, the public sector who are um, supporting their local communities with taking advantage of programs like that or participating um, and mobilizing um, the ZEV goals. Um, to better plan around these kinds of things, there are specific strategies and policy development um, resources that local agencies can take advantage of. One of them is the ZEV market development strategy, and we'll provide a link to that as well. And if you're looking for more detail about other sectors and other regulations and legislation, um, there is a great comprehensive list that we'll drop the link to as well from Berkeley. And that's all at the state level. If you're looking for something that is more local um, or regional, many local air districts or air quality districts have more information and resources and funding opportunities um, that agencies can take advantage of. So I know that was a lot of information. I tried to make it digestible and just small little nuggets to give you an idea of how your agency or your um, plans that you're trying to implement fit into the larger stage at the state level. Great, thank you, Justine. And now, I would, before we get to the presenters, I would like to open up a quick poll just to gain everyone's familiarity with uh, EVs. 
So if you can go ahead and uh, take a few seconds just to answer that question, that would be great. See, it looks like our responses are slowing down. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I will end it there just in the interest of time. Um, but it looks like we have a pretty even split across the board when it comes to film uh, familiarity, uh, whether you're in the public sector or a member of the public. So I'm um, very happy to have everyone here and, and learn more. <clears throat> and uh, now I would like to hand the mic over to our first speaker, Tara Campy, Deputy Director of Cal State's Hybrid and Zero Emission Truck and Bus Voucher Incentive Project. So Tara, I'll leave it up to you. Great, thank you so much. It's great to be here um, to let you know more information about California's on-road truck and bus voucher incentive project. It is active um, throughout the state of California and has been in um, operation for over 10 years. Um, it's, it's administered by um, CalSTAR, we're a national nonprofit headquartered in Pasadena and we administer the program on behalf of the California Air Resources Board. Uh, next slide. HVIP has deployed over 7,000 vehicles and has really robust funding over 400 million, um, which with much more funding to come next year, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And um, it's a streamlined approach so that purchasers receive the incentive amount on the vehicle upfront immediately at the point of sale. And then we work with the dealers to redeem the voucher when the vehicle has been delivered and built. Um, so it's envisioned and uh, structured to be a um, user-friendly process for the purchasing fleet. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, dealers learn the voucher processing system itself, the paperwork process, the online request process, and then uh, funding is set aside immediately at the point of voucher request. So there's no application period and there's also no scrappage required. And um, the, the list of vehicles that we have available is published on our website uh, in a vehicle catalog that shows images of all the vehicles and how much the incentive amount is for each one. Next slide. How to participate as a public fleet or any other purchasing fleet. Um, HF is open to anyone that uh, operates a commercial vehicle in the state of California. Um, you simply work with a dealer who's listed on our website and um, then you will complete the paperwork with them and um, they'll take it from there to request the voucher on your behalf working with us. And um, so you uh, have to sign some terms and conditions that govern how you use the vehicle for three years. But other than that, uh, the dealer handles um, the, the implementation and uh, paperwork details with our staff. Next slide. As I mentioned, we have an online catalog where you can explore all the vehicles and how much um, the incentives are. We don't list the total cost of the vehicle because that's determined between you and your dealer uh, is, as to what the actual cost of the vehicle is. Um, it, maybe there's options added or whatever, but regardless, the incentive amount is set for each um, vehicle type in the catalog. And then um, we do um, require the total uh, sale amount to be disclosed as well. And currently in our catalog, 
uh, we only have electric power takeoff vehicles and then everything else is zero emission. Uh, so fuel cell electric and battery electric school buses, heavy duty buses, uh, panel and step vans, et cetera, um, as shown on this slide. Next slide. There's a lot of uh, details that went into effect for this year's round of funding, uh, which the last wave of that funding goes out uh, on Thursday. So if anyone's queued up to participate already in, on Thursday, you can let me know if you have any outstanding questions. Otherwise, new funding will be available uh, around the beginning of calendar year 2022. So we encourage you to start the process now of um, looking into what you might like to buy. Um, but one change that went into effect this year is that um, natural gas vehicles are no longer eligible for HVIP unless they're certified to the optional uh, 0.03 credential, but um, there currently aren't any vehicles at that standard in the catalog. And so it's all zero emission and EPTO. Next slide. Uh, these are the funding tables that show how much the um, incentive is in each category. And then when you go on the catalog online, it shows what a precise funding amount is available for each vehicle in the catalog. Um, and um, there is a cap currently of 30 voucher requests per fleet per calendar year. Uh, so you'd have to um, request just 30 if you have a larger order, it would have to be spread over a couple of years if you want HVIP funding for it. Um, next slide. There are increases in the voucher amount. Those are set and standard as well. More funding for public transit agencies, fuel cell, and if you're domiciled, your vehicle home base is in a disadvantaged community, which are census designated. And there's a map on our website so you can see if your vehicle is located in one of those areas. Next slide. Uh, the Air Resources Board really targets funding to disadvantaged communi communities that are disproportionately affected by air pollution. Um, and over the course of the lifespan of the HVIP program, over 58% of vouchers have been uh, gone to vehicles that are located in those communities. And you can see a breakdown by county on this graphic. Next slide. Uh, about 165 million was available this year. And as I mentioned, the last wave, which is about 60 million will be going out on Thursday. Next slide. Um, you can skip this one, I, I mentioned that already, but it is, uh, as I should have mentioned, it's first come first serve. So um, dealers get in queue in our online request system and then it's uh, first come first serve. And um, the, program is meant to incentivize new purchases. And so um, there's dates that govern how old your purchase order can be. So for example, if you had a purchase made a couple of years ago, it wouldn't be eligible for funding at this point. Next slide. We do also have a suite of online tools, which you can check out on our website, a total cost of ownership estimator that lets you know what it costs to operate your new EV versus a comparable gasoline powered vehicle, funding finder tool that lets you look at other public incentives other than HVIP and lots of planning tools for infrastructure as well. Next slide. Uh, we can skip that one in the interest of time. Um, some some forward looking news here. Um, the, the funding plan at the Air Resources Board that provides the funding, that's going up for board approval on um, November 19th. And that will let us know more about next year's uh, slate of funding. But we already know from the legislature that there's over 500 million for HVIP alone, going to things like um, zero emission school buses, transit buses, and vehicles that are doing uh, short haul um, port drayage activities, as well as well over 200 million for all the other vehicles in HVIP's catalog. So we definitely encourage you to start to look into what you might want to purchase um, with next year's funding. Next slide. Uh, we could go ahead and skip. That's just details of what's in the funding plan. And there's more to come even after 21-22. There's other funding designated by the legislature. So it's a really good time um, for electric vehicles in, in uh, public incentive funding programs like HVIP. Next slide. You can skip that one too. 
and that one. <laughs> And that one, sorry, there's a, an interest of time, we'll, we'll skip through that, but there is a public comment as well available until November 8th on how the Air Resources Board is designating that funding. Um, but it's really historic. It's um, more funding next year in HFIP than in our uh, whole history till now. So um, I'm always here to answer any questions as you start to look at what your fleet wants to acquire and start to plan to work with dealers to um, get in in early 2022. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. Really appreciate that. Uh, just a reminder to all of our guests that um, we ask you to all save your questions to the Q&A at the end, just so we can get through the presentations. Um, next up, we'll have a joint presentation from Omar Ferris and Michael Kadish, okay. transportation, uh, excuse me, transportation electrification advisors from Southern California Edison. Omar and Michael, please take it away. Hello. Uh, sorry, I don't know why my video just shut off, but there it is. Okay, so uh, everybody sees my screen. Thumbs up. All right, so we're going to boogie through this as best we can. My name is Omar Ferris. Uh, I'm a transportation electrification advisor with Southern California Edison's business customer division. So really keyed in on the customer engagement piece of our uh, TE programs, uh, specifically on the light duty side, my colleague Mike takes care of the medium and heavy duty side, which is a gross vehicle weight rating of 6,000 pounds and above. Um, so talk about the newly launched light duty program. So the charge ready program in short uh, is a program uh, that is intended to provide make ready infrastructure to support the installation of electric vehicle charging stations. So uh, the operative term there is make ready. So that encompasses anything from the transformer all the way to the conduit stub out where uh, you as the customers would install uh, and maintain the charging station equipment. The program itself uh, is scheduled to run four years uh, and is about $430 million uh, in total funding. So it's a very robust program. Uh, and we have a lot of early interest. So we're very excited about that. Um, so within the Charge Ready program, we have a few distinct offerings. Um, we have a very heavy, heavy emphasis on multifamily, um, which you'll see here. Um, but the core piece of the program is the charging infrastructure and rebate. So that's the piece of the program that provides that make ready infrastructure. Uh, and in addition to that, provides a, a one-time rebate to help offset the cost of the charging stations. And that's uh, consistent with um, your business segment, whether you're multifamily uh, or commercial, uh, as well as your DAC status, disadvantaged community. Uh, and we do um, determine your DAC status based on the Cal Enviro Screen SB 535 map, which just got updated to Cal Enviro Screen 4.0. Um, so we'll be rolling that out shortly to determine DAC status. Um, so as you see here, the charging infrastructure and rebate uh, is uh, built out to support 19,500 level one or level two ports. We anticipate that we, we're going to be looking at probably 99% level two. Uh, we do have a very small carve out for DC fast charging, which is pending CPUC approval. Um, that one's going to be a very targeted and small piece of uh, the charge ready offering. So more to come on that, probably say Q3 of 2022. Uh, we do have some aggressive uh, DAC targets, uh, again, as well as multifamily. Um, so you'll see our multifamily targets, um, you know, reflected in the program offerings. We do offer a full turnkey installation, installation solution, which takes the charging infrastructure and rebate a step further. Uh, and Edison owns uh, and installs the charging station on behalf of the customer record. Um, this is reserved for multifamily properties located in disadvantaged communities. Uh, it is a very small, a relatively small carve out. I would say uh, it's going to be roughly 2,500 uh, ports supported by this piece of the program. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, core piece, is the new construction rebate, which is meant to incentivize multifamily developers uh, to install charging stations at new construction projects uh, that exceed uh, the Cal Green Code requirement. So this piece of the program offers $3,500 per port to bridge that gap and get the charging stations in the ground where there is already uh, the make ready infrastructure. This is a fairly large piece of our program, uh, 15,000 level one or level two ports with a 50% port target in disadvantaged communities. Cool. So um, this is the, uh, how I like to summarize, or this is what I like to use to summarize kind of the value proposition of the program. So uh, this goes back to the make ready term. Uh, typical scope of work for a utility is the transformer to the, uh, to the meter, 
uh, and we typically would set a meter on the panel and the customer would take the power where they need it, whether it's an EV application or uh, you know, a commercial application. Uh, for the purposes of charge ready, Edison takes care of both the utility side infrastructure and customer side infrastructure. Uh, we provide a transformer, set it on our pad, pull our service wire through uh, conduit or through ducts and structures that we set, uh, tie into a meter, which is set on a panel that we provide, and then we run the conduit wires all the way out to the uh, make ready stub outs where you as a customer would install the charging stations. Uh, so down below, you'll see the minimum port requirements. Uh, universally, it's a four port minimum to participate in the program. Uh, what we're seeing early on is that four ports is really challenging from a cost feasibility perspective. Uh, we do have prescribed uh, cost metrics as given to us by the state that we have to abide by. Uh, so four ports is a challenge, not impossible. Um, we typically see um, six to 10 ports starting to be kind of the low range of what's actually cost feasible. Um, and as you'll see, the new construction rebate does offer uh, a one port minimum uh, as long as you are exceeding that Cal Green Code uh, requirement. Uh, one other wrinkle in our program is that we do offer um, a customer built uh, infrastructure option. So if you as a customer want to manage the beyond the meter portion, uh, we will offer you a one time rebate of up to 80% of Edison's cost or 80% of your costs, whichever is less. Uh, with the exchange, of course, that you would project manage and install that piece, uh, and you would still be eligible for the charging station rebate portion. My last slide is just kind of the key program requirements. So the applicant does need to be um, an SCE customer. Non, Non-residential is a little misleading, so we do offer this for multifamily, but non-single family households um, and commercial customers are eligible. Must own lease manager be the customer record of the charging site. Uh, if not, obtain consent from the property owner. There's an easement requirement so we can have reasonable access to our equipment when needed. Um, and of course, be located in SCE service territory. Um, four port minimum we already touched on. When we do roll out our DC fast charging, also known as level three, um, there will be a two port minimum and they must be publicly accessible. The rest of our site prioritization criteria is what's being worked out with the CPUC right now. Um, we do require the equipment to be separately metered, uh, which is part of our scope of work is providing that new uh, meter and panel. Uh, there is a requirement to enroll in a demand response program. Um, these are essentially programs that uh, offer bill credits in exchange for load curtailment when prompted by the utility. Um, the requirement is to enroll. It is not to remain on the program, just to be clear. Uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, we do have an approved product list, which you are required to select from uh, for the charging stations. It's rather extensive. We have all the major um, manufacturers on there, so there will be something on there to suit your needs. Um, we do require the equipment be operational for a period of 10 years. It's not to say you can't replace the charging equipment at your own cost, but we do need the equipment to be connected to our infrastructure for that minimum 10 year period. Um, we do require that the charging data uh, be provided to us monthly as, um, provided by a networking agreement uh, between you and your uh, EVSE, so your charging station uh, provider, uh, as well as uh, report the prices that you do charge to EV drivers. If you do decide to charge a fee for these, uh, we do ask to know about that. This information, both the charging data and prices are aggregated and reported to the state. Uh, again, for reporting purposes, uh, we're not gonna regulate um, you know, your uh, minimum consumption or the prices that you charge to the drivers, just so we're clear. I spoke very quickly, quicker than I normally do. So I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Mike, who is gonna cover our medium and heavy duty program. Excellent, thank you, Omar. It'd be my pleasure to uh, cover our medium duty, heavy duty program for Southern California Edison. Also, thank you to CalSTAR, pg and &E, of course, the Sierra Business Council for allowing us to present on the uh, quarterly workshop today. So Charge Ready Transport Program um, is a $356 million program which launched in May of 2019. It's primarily an electric vehicle driven uh, program. There is a requirement for the customer to be either purchasing or leasing vehicles. We're looking to electrify 8,490 electric vehicles in uh, total. Um, this money that's $356 million is um, set to cover the cost of the infrastructure. Uh, which we provide to the customer. There's also an 80% uh, option as well, where the customer could perform the work and we would provide them 80% uh, of those funds for an eligible customer. 
In addition to the infrastructure, uh, there is a rebate for the charging stations. These re rebates are available to transit agencies, school districts, as well as um, some sites in disadvantaged communities that are non Fortune 1000. Um, just at the bottom, you can see that kind of the, the process flow as the customer applies. We reserve uh, funding once they uh, uh, sign the agreement. Uh, for the Edison Turnkey, we issue, a, we get all the permits, we do the design plan um, portion, phase the program, and then we would uh, provide the rebate. Next slide, please, Omar. As, uh, yeah, so I, as Omar mentioned, it's a uh, greater than 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight rating uh, program, class two. You can kind of get a feel for the types of uh, uh, vehicles that we pro um, provide uh, with infrastructure for this program. It's either medium duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles. There's also a non-road component, such as forklifts, uh, TRUs, as well as yard hostlers, and uh, primarily, um, you know, any, any other vehicle that is exceeding 6,000 pound GVWR, which could be airport ground support equipment. Uh, we also have a carve out for a truck stop electrification uh, component as well. Go ahead and do the next slide, please. So yeah, so it's a five-year program. Um, talked about the, the vehicles. It is the uh, two vehicle minimum uh, requirement for the program. Once a customer signs the agreement, they are required to, uh, there's at least two vehicles that must materialize within 18 months of that signed agreement. That could be via a lease or a purchase. We have some minimums uh, for our different budget categories and seem to be on track for all of them. Uh, transit agencies, ports and warehouses, 40% DAC has not been an issue, 10% uh, maximum for forklifts and 10% uh, maximum for program management. Go ahead and do the next slide, please. Okay, so yes, the, um, the equipment rebate, I mentioned the school transit bus, I mentioned the disadvantaged community. Uh, those customers not listed on the Fortune 1000 list are eligible for the uh, rebate for the charger and all charging equipment must be selected from the APL. Go ahead and do the next slide, please. Okay, so I'll put in a uh, in the link, uh, in the chat, a link for the charge rate transport program. We also offer another service, which is um, known as our Transportation Electrification Advisory Service, or TEAS for short. You can kind of think of this as a customer that may want to apply in the future, but they're not quite ready yet. They don't really know how to proceed. Uh, so with this tease, we have a uh, group of um, internal uh, employees that can go and create a um, deliverable product known as an EV readiness study. And for this EV readiness st study, they will um, evaluate multifamily properties with um, 100 or, four or fewer units. Um, they will also um, provide EV rental studies for commercial customers and for medium duty, heavy duty customers as well. In addition to that, um, they'll be providing webinar, webinars, workshops, um, and in the future, uh, some grant writing assistance will be provided as well. Uh, you can kind of get uh, a perspective of what that deliverable product is on the right hand side as an example report for our T's. Um, service. And with that, that concludes my slides, I believe. And we'll hand it over to, oh, thank you, Omar, for that. And I'll hand it over to Tim. I believe he's doing the next one. Appreciate that, Michael. <clears throat> so let's see. Hopefully, you guys can see my slides. Um, so just to set some content or context here. Uh, so what um, Tara had covered was on the HVIP. That's for medium and heavy duty fleet. Uh, what Omar covered was uh, SoCal Edison's program for the light duty uh, vehicle assistance charging program. And then Michael did the uh, medium heavy duty. So uh, with pg &E, our light duty assistance program, which was called EVCN or electric vehicle charge network, uh, was a three-year program. It was fully subscribed in one year, totally done, had to close it. And uh, so that was closed with pg &E's light duty site. So what I'm going to cover is pg es EV fleet program, which is what's similar to what uh, Michael covered uh, on his. And you're gonna see some similarities between uh, SoCal Edison's program and pg es program. 
Uh, and there's a couple things that we do to try to partner. Example, uh, Michael mentioned the approved vendor list or the, um, the APL. Uh, so uh, we are in agreement that if a customer or if there's a charger or something on SoCal Edison's side of the list, the PG&E will accept it and honor it. And same thing, they'll accept ours. We still have two lists. Apparently we like each other, but we don't love each other. Otherwise we'd give you one list. I'm just kidding. We do love each other. So um, we're partners in this and we do feel like you guys are partners as well. So I'll start out by just saying that um, uh, as Michael said, we do appreciate you guys allowing us to be on here and talk about our programs, educate you a little bit, answer your questions. And we're seeing a lot of traction happening. So get in the program, EV fleet. Uh, it's also a five-year program, runs through the end of 2024. That's the important thing for you guys to hit. By the way, you hear all of us talking pretty fast. It's because this presentation, I usually give to customers when they're onboarding or they're coming on, and it takes about 20 minutes. So I have about, oh, I think eight minutes since I've been gabbing. So um, I'll try to throw down a little bit faster here. So uh, apologize for talking fast. So within that uh, five-year time period, remember, big date to remember is uh, December 31st, 2024. That's when the program ends, when everything has to be installed and operational. We're gonna partner with 700 customer sites, getting 6,500 new or converted medium and heavy duty fleet vehicles on the road. Top part of the pie here is the on-road vehicles in the program. Bottom is the off-road. You're gonna see both what uh, Michael mentioned and Omar is that 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight cutoff. It needs to be over 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight in order to qualify for the program. You will also see as uh, SEE, we have some uh, stipulations for some off-road uh, equipment that can come into the program. I have a, pro I have a um, customer I'm working with just doing uh, 20 forklifts at their site. So we can go ahead and do that. We can help you with that. And of course, you'll see others such as school buses, transit buses. This is not all inclusive. Uh, example, refuge trucks qualify for the program as long as they're over 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight and they're not on here, but they do qualify for the program. So this is the main gist. You saw this a little bit. I'm gonna kind of go through this again, just a little bit to understand that when we break in, when we look at a customer's charging infrastructure, we break it into three sections. The first section there in green is called TTM. That stands for to the meter. This includes the distribution pole off your property, the service stop, drop, your transformer sitting there. And TTM also includes the trenching conduit and conductor over to the customer's new meter panel, which as Michael mentioned or Omar, that this usually is inside the, um, um, your new meter panel. But TTM, normally customers have to pay for these upgrades. And this is anywhere from $100,000 to $500,000. But under the EV fleet program, PG&E covers all of these costs free of charge to customers. So it's a significant savings to be in the EV fleet program just in that one alone. So the next section of the charging infrastructure is called BTM. They're in blue. That stands for behind the meter. Now, this is the customer's responsibility to purchase and install through your contractor. Uh, this includes the customer's new meter panel, plus any breakers and switch gear inside the meter panel. And BTM also includes all of the trenching conduit and conductor from the meter panel over to the base of the charging stations. Now, uh, unlike some of the programs that you, you, you've heard about and some of the different uh, utility programs, uh, this is the customer's responsibility to purchase and install, install the BTM within uh, their, on their site. But pg &E will pay the customer a BTM incentive to help them offset their cost of them doing this. Example, if it's school buses, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, this blue box will line out what types of vehicles uh, get a different size of, um, of credit. And it's basically because they are offsetting more emissions. And this is an emissions-based program that California is pushing out. So in this case, school buses, if you see in the very bottom, receive a credit of $4,000. If a school said, hey, we're going to put into service five school buses over the next three years, we're going to put together uh, one in 22, uh, two in 2023, and two in 2024, five buses total, then we're going to be able to pay you five times $4,000 we'll be able to commit to paying the customer a $20,000 BTM incentive. Now, that's the second part. So the customers design it, they build it, they pay for it, but we pay a BTM incentive. So the third and final part of the charging infrastructure is of course there in orange is the charging station itself. Now, some customers will qualify for a charger rebate in addition to the BTM incentive, in addition to all the TTM for free. And that is anybody who's uh, driving a school bus, anybody who's doing a transit bus, or as you've heard uh, Tara mention, as far as uh, I think both also Omar and Michael mentioned, uh, those customers inside of a disadvantaged community. And so if you're in a DAC and you're not a school or transit agency, you still qualify for the charger rebate. Couple criteria, you have to use a charger that is on the APL that I mentioned, uh, either through SCE's 
program or for pg and es program has to be an approved list and you can't be a fortune 1000 customer and as long as you do that yes the rebate covers about 50 percent of the purchase price of the charging station itself up to the limits you see in that upper right hand orange block don't be too, too concerned about those limits. Most customers don't hit those. Example, if you buy a level two charging station, most customers on the commercial side will pay about $10,000. Uh, we would pay, again, 50% for a qualified uh, charger to be installed. Uh, that's $5,000, nowhere near the $15,000 max. But that's the layout of what we look at for the most part when we're looking at a customer's uh, charging infrastructure and how we lay it out. Let's talk about what we expect the customers when they're coming through the program. Number one is that uh, we want customers to uh, set, tell us what their uh, vehicle deployment schedule is or their long-term plan. This is very simple, 20, it's three lines of data, 2022, 23, 24. Each line will have two bits of information, how many vehicles and how many chargers, and we'll go through that. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention as I'm trying to speed through this is we do ask that customers own a lease of property where the charger is going to be installed and that they agree to uh, operate and maintain the vehicles and the charging stations for a minimum of 10 years. We'll also be reporting usage back to the CPUC, which all of the utility programs do because the CPUC says if we're dumping a half million dollars into somebody's project, we want to know that the charger is being used. Nothing that the customer has to do. We will report this data for you. What do we need from a customer who's ready to apply? Number one, you got to show us that you have a paid invoice, you've already ordered your vehicles, or you have an approved vehicle grant. You're serious about this, you're ready to move, then we can accept your application and we can start working through uh, getting the design done. And I'm going to cover this in just a little bit. And the next slide, we want to make sure that you uh, know where exactly you want your charging stations, because when the design team comes out, they're going to say, uh, Hey, uh, Justine, where do you want your charging station? She's going to say, uh, up against that fence line in front of those. How many charging stations do you want? Uh, I want two 19 kW charging stations and a 50 kW DC fast charger. Okay, sounds good. Now they can start working on your design that you're going to do over that five-year period. A couple of things. We need to make sure that you know you're going to have a little bit of out-of-pocket funding costs for your BTM. You can use uh, vehicle grants. You can use HVIP. You can use all these and stack on top of each other. We have about 50 schools in the program right now besides other customers, but uh, a, a majority of those schools are doing their entire project uh, vehicles and infrastructure cost, and it's 100% covered. So you can stack a dollars on top of this and come out really well. What else? Uh, when, let's talk about the... Uh, the process you're going to go through. There's two phases to the EV fleet program. First phase on the left there is called preliminary design phase, takes about three to five months. Second phase is called final design and execution, sometimes better thought of as construction, takes about six to eight months. So the timing is very similar to, to SoCal Edison's timing as far as how long it takes to get chargers energized. Uh, number one, you submit uh, there on the preliminary design phase, left side. You submit your application. We, uh, we hire an engineering design firm. They will quickly call you, set up a site walk, come out, ask you those, just, those questions that I just asked Justine to answer. And uh, they're going to look at your transformer. They're going to take measurements. They're going to open up the uh, transform, make sure we have enough room to bring in additional conduit. Then they're going to go back and put the design together. They will submit that back to pg and EV fleet program. We'll do an approval call once everybody gives thumbs up. Number five, we can do a contract. Once you sign the contract, return it, we'll countersign it, and we move you to the other side of the orange line. Then you're in the second phase, final design and execution. You'll be assigned a construction project manager by pg and &E. They'll work with your, your, uh, your customer or the customer's uh, contractor who's doing the BTM, make sure coordination is done. Hopefully the BTM will be done in, in, in six months, so will the TTM work, and that pg and &E number 13 will energize your new meter panel, and you guys are off and running. You will charge your, your energize your charging stations, or energize your vehicles and go to town. At that point, you can submit back to PG&E any paid invoices so that you receive uh, your um, incentives or rebates. Now that's the end of the EV fleet part of it. I'm gonna give you two quick bonus items. First one is pg and &E has a business electric vehicle charging rate. I'm not gonna go into the rate. It's a great thing if you have electric vehicle charging. Uh, you can receive anywhere from 20 to 30% discount as regards to your regular um, um, rate on your facility. But the big thing is you have to have your electric vehicles, uh, your charging stations on a separate pg and &E meter than the rest of the facility. So that's the big thing. You, that's why you saw me say this five slides ago, you have a new meter panel for your charging stations. You will want to do this so that your EVs, your charging stations are on a separate pg and &E meter. The second bonus item I have for you, I'm not going to go through all these slides. 
I'm just going to tell you, go to fleets.pge.com. It's a very powerful tool. This tool, you can have all kinds of scenarios of plug in whatever vehicles. You can select vehicles. You go through a vehicle catalog. It's great. You can identify how many miles it's going to drive, how many days per week, what you pay for a gallon of diesel. And so we now know that this diesel version of this truck driving 100 miles per day, five days a week, when you pay $3.10 a gallon, uses $16,000 of diesel per year. The same electric version of this will use $8,000 of electricity per year. Uh, eight, 16 minus eight is obviously $8,000 savings. There's all kinds of other tools in here. Low carbon fuel standard calculator. Uh, there's information about your chargers, information about what emissions you're going to be reducing. This and very similar to CalStart has their their funding filter tool. A pg &E has a funding uh, kind of a grant finder tool within this as well. So that's uh, that's one more thing that's in there. So great tools. I won't go in there. I'm out of time. I know we want to get some questions and answers from you guys. So I'm going to hand it back to James. Yes, thank you, Tim, and thank you to. The other panelists, we really appreciate you uh, sharing your resources with us. So uh, now I'd like to open up the rest of the webinar to Q&A. So feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask away questions, or you can type questions in the Q&A or the chat box. And it looks like we did have um, our first first question drop in. I'll go ahead and read it for our speakers. Um, so I know that um, we're focusing today on PG&E, Southern California Edison, and then of course the CalSTART HVIP program. But um, do any of you happen to know for folks who aren't in PG&E or Southern California Edison territory, um, any idea of, of how to um, take advantage of other programs um how nope. to start don't care <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> Tim, right out of <laughs> no. uh, so i am not intimately familiar with the um uh our partner utilities offerings pg e and edison i think are kind of spearheading the effort statewide i know san diego gas and electric has a version of of what we offer uh, but I don't know that the different, uh, maybe smaller municipal utilities have similar offerings. I uh, don't know if Tim or Mike have any additional insight. Yeah, what I would say is honestly, and whatever area you're in, you should start looking at, an example, you might be in Central Coast Air Districts area or Bay Area Air Quality Management Districts. It's very important, and you're going to find some of the tools that I mentioned also with CalStarts, is when you go in there and you identify, you put in your zip code and your sector type, hit enter, and it will populate all the different programs that are available to you, and that's statewide, federal-wide, and utility-wide. So go use those tools. They will help identify, and then they'll give you the contact information and the program information for going to those various tools. Because as you heard from CalSTART, it's, you know, you, you can get into a statewide program, but you might be in an area where the air district will only serve your areas. So use those tools and get a hold of the air district in your area to determine what they have available. Great. It looks like the questions are rolling in. Um, so I'm just going to start at the top here. Um, someone's curious what the impact panelists have seen on the rate of adoption slash use of their program since the governor's executive order in 2020, if any. Uh, I can go ahead and start on that. It's, I'll tell you that you know, for light duty, it's a little different. Like I explained, that our program was fully subscribed in 12 months. Very, it's a little bit different when you're doing infrastructure for light duty vehicles. Medium duty takes planning. You saw that both of the infrastructure, both for SoCal Edison and pg &E, and I know so, uh, the, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, it takes about a year. This is not something that somebody just says, oh yeah, go grab some of those. It doesn't happen like that. So we have been seeing an uptick, but a very slow uptick. I imagine in the next year or so, you're going to start seeing much more as vehicles become more available and uh, customers start seeing that they can really make it work and you can, then I think you're gonna see the adoption really blow out of the water. So uh, I'll jump in from a light duty perspective because that's the, the world in which I live. Um, so we've had pent up demand for a new light duty program for uh, the past three or four years now. We did run a pilot uh, program that was very successful. 
Uh, and the minute that that one was subscribed, we you know rolled out a, a bridge program uh, to get us to the new program. And we had um, you know several hundred applications for the new program within the first month uh, of launch in July. So uh, the um, interest is there, the enthusiasm is there on the light duty side, um, and all which segues kind of to to Mike, which uh, is on the medium and heavy duty side to uh, echo Tim, I think the interest and ramp up is going to, to jump significantly with uh, the rollout of the half ton pickups, you know, the Chevy Silverado, the Ford F-150 Lightning, Cybertruck, um, those will creep into that 6,000 pounds uh, or greater territory. So Mike, I don't know. I, I didn't I, I didn't actually segue to you, Mike. I actually stole your thunder. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you hit it perfectly, Omar. Yeah, when the program launched in May of 2019, which is two and a half years ago, um, our primary applicants were school buses and transit buses. Uh, frankly, it was about 50% of our applicants. Um, that was very um, obvious, you know, use case. Uh, short routes, defined, low speeds. Um, so there were a lot of products that are on the market. And as um, Omar and um, Tim mentioned, you know, we're starting to see um, some momentum building in those other use cases, such as, you know, the F-150 Lightning, the Chevy Silverado. Uh, there's definitely a lot of interest in uh, um, trailer refrigeration units, getting charging for those, especially with the pending um, uh, regulations that are coming down the pike. Um, so, you know, we're, 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 we've seen pretty much a consistent, we had pent up demand, then we saw a consistent uh, rate of applications. And lately, I will say um, last month, even we, we had our highest rate of applications of any month. So I think it's, it's picking up, you know, eventually that um, wave kind of builds and builds. If I can also clarify just what on, on Michael, not clarify what he said, but uh, I, I have some customers and they say, well, hey, what, what's a, what's a 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight? And so a lot of times we'll say class one is like an F-150, class two is an F-250, class three, generally. But somebody, I, I want to clarify that as what both Omar and Michael pointed out is the new F-150 coming out from Ford, the Lightning, most of the tow options are going to be above 6,000 pounds. So they, that F-150 Lightning will qualify for the medium heavy duty fleet vehicle programs. Uh, and also HVIP, as you noticed, uh, I think uh, Tara pointed out that the, uh, the lowest was class 2B category classification to, uh, to come into those. And you will find some of those F-150 Lightnings will also fit the class 2B category, I believe. Great, thanks. Tara, did you have something to add there? Yeah, I can just add that um, that Tim, Tim's correct. Uh, 2B is technically eligible for HVIP, but um, the Air Resources Board is going through a public process to determine um, which use cases would make sense for that versus um, having them in the light duty um, clean vehicle rebate program um, at the state level. So there's currently no 2B um, vehicles in HVIP. But in relation to the governor's executive order, there's a lot of um, legislation in the medium heavy duty space that's kind of uh, in tandem with that. There's the advanced clean truck rule that is going to start uh, mandating manufacturer um, zero emission vehicle production. And then uh, rulemaking is underway for the advanced clean fleet rules that will uh, require clean vehicle purchases. So, the legislature is definitely supporting that with the historic investment that I mentioned that's coming um, down the pipeline next year. So um, the industry will be able to um, receive substantive support to meet those mandates when they eventually come. Great, thank you. I'm gonna jump around on our Q&A here a little bit. Um, Jim Marino has a really specific question that I wanna um, see if we can answer for him. He asks, can you speak to the AP L, are the, vendor, are the vendors listed approved for sole source purchase, purchasing or cooperative purchasing for public agencies? Is that a question for HVIP? 
No, I think I think that would speak to the utility programs. Uh, Mike, I don't have an intelligent answer for that. I don't know. If you know. Um, yeah, so um, I'll kind of I, I think where that um, question is is um, hitting at was in the first iteration of the approved product list or APL, we had um, approved vendors as well as approved products. Now we've uh, we came to the uh, conclusion after a while that the actual vendors, um, that was not really um, necessary. We we're vendor agnostic. We're also vehicle agnostic, but we are not technology agnostic. So the products that are on our approved product list um, go through a nationally recognized testing laboratory certification. Um, there is some, you know, documents that go back and forth between us and the manufacturers. And if it complies with these certain safety standards, um, as, as well as, you know, uh, the neural certification that I mentioned, then it, it does get listed on our APL. So the APL is um, specific to the technology, the equipment. Uh, we also have uh, network providers that are on there and we no longer have the uh, vendors list on our APL. I hope that answers the question. And I, I would probably add that um, I think somewhere else where I was kind of reading in this, and I probably was I probably read wrong, but if somebody's asking, does it vary by a customer segment? Uh, no, you're, you're the same, you know, list of approved equipment is approved for the public sector as it is the private as it is government relations. So, so you should be that one list is for all customers as far as that works. Thanks everyone. Obviously we are, are packing a ton of information in here and I think we have time for just one more um, question, although it's hard to choose. Um, I'm gonna start at the top. What are the most common barriers for adoption that customers typically have to overcome for each program? Mm. I'll go with that one just because I hate talking. Um, so uh, one of the biggest things we find from customers is, of course, uh, getting the funding, the funding for vehicles. That's why we have so many tools on helping you find the funding. Uh, a, a school can't afford a $400,000 school bus as regards to $150,000 or $200,000 bus. So that's probably one of the biggest things. The second thing is going to be uh, getting the vehicle availability as uh, what Omar mentioned and what Michael mentioned was when we first started the programs, yeah, it was school buses and transit buses because they were getting the grants and the buses were available. You know, refuge trucks aren't really available. You just see the Ford, you know, some of the box trucks and some of the other stuff and Rivian manufacturers that are just coming out. So some of these uh, vehicles are just becoming available. You're going to see those class eight trucks coming available next year. So that was really kind of a, a restraint is trying to find the right vehicle. So I'm going to plug that one tool again, that, that vehicle category catalog. So you can go in there and search by what you're looking for and it will pop up and it will tell you the exact manufacturer that does fit your criteria of a box truck that can go 200 miles uh, on a day or blah, 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 that sort of thing. And then the other thing I'm going to shoot this and then I'm going to be quiet is the big thing is get a hold of the utilities early, as early as possible. What we don't want to see is someone says, hey, Tim, I'm going to have some buses show up in three months. Can I get some charging stations? And the truth is, no, you're going to have them sitting there for about another six months after that. So get a hold of the utility who whichever service territory you're in and try to talk to them ahead of time. Some customers I'm talking to a year or two ahead of time, and we don't hold up their, their, their project with the construction. That'll be all. <laughs> I'll, I'll add on um, to what Tim was talking about as well. For for our programs, I'm sure uh, Tim does with his program as well as our program. Um, you know, we can get the design ready for the customer and um, progressing as soon as the design um, gets kind of galvanized. The uh, framework, you know, where do you want the chargers? How many chargers? What's your 10-year vehicle acquisition plan? When it's a um, when it's a dartboard that's continually moving, it's very difficult to throw a bullseye in, in, uh, with a dart. So um, the sooner we can get a commitment on, hey, this is our scope, this is what our project is going to, what, this is what we want to accomplish with our project, this is our 10-year vehicle acquisition plan, boom, we can hit the ground running. Um, but a lot of times it gets kind of, um, uh, you know, um, we get tripped up on, you know, getting those uh, granular details. Uh, 
Um, sorry to cut everyone off. Obviously, this conversation is super rich and helpful. Um, and uh, I encourage everyone, if it's okay with the speakers, um, if you do have outstanding questions, to continue um, to reach out to them and get their take. Um, and of course, you're definitely um, encouraged to reach out to us at Sierra Camp at sierrabusiness.org, and we will um, we will do our best to answer them and to connect you with the folks who are experts. Um, Justine, I'll pass it off to you to close us out. Sure, thank you, Jill, and thank you everyone today. This was great, very valuable information. Um, and as we kind of said at the beginning, this was really high level and just touching on some of the details, but there is plenty more to dive into. So if you want to pursue um, EV infrastructure and fleet electrification, definitely reach out to um, these program administrators. Um, they have everything you need. Um, so that's all about we have uh, time for today, but before we close, I want to highlight a few um, programs and upcoming events that we think that our um, audience would like to know more about. Um, so first of all, our Sierra Nevada Energy Watch program has a new energy management services um, program that is now available to our customers in the public sector in the PG&E territory that um, we have across 14 counties. Um, if you want to learn more, um, please check out our website. Um, there you can find out if you're eligible for our programs, um, what our services are, um, and how to um, begin that process with us to start increasing your energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Um, I'll just note that this program is of no cost to our customers um, because we're leveraging ratepayer funding um, and bringing those savings back to you in the pg and &E territory, in our um, SNU territory. Um, if you also are interested in our Sierra Small Business Development Center news and updates, we have um, a webinar coming up on November 16th. Um, it's the State Savings and Financing Program for Your Small Business webinar, and it's going to include speakers from the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority say that 10 times fast, um, which will cover sales tax exclusions and financing options to promote alternative energy and energy efficiency, as well as speakers from the California Pollution Control Financing Authority, um, which supports small businesses um, with their financing, including special financing for EV transportation and charging projects. So if anyone knows any business owners or entrepreneurs or you are yourself, um, and you're interested in um, more on this topic, um, we have a link to register, which we will drop in the chat box. Um, and again, as Jill said, if you have any questions for us or want to learn more about Sierra Camp, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have our email there. And if you aren't a member and you would like to join, um, don't hesitate to do so either. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. Again, that was really valuable, great information. Um, a great way to get um, everyone started on their own EV projects and implementing um, cleaner energy within their agencies. And thank you so much to um, Jill and James as well. This was a great um, workshop and look forward to um, talking more to everyone about EVs. Amazing, thanks all.